for having me. And let me thank Joan, who reached out and invited me to come. And I'm really happy to be here. Uh, you know, Vermont Law School is uh, has its reputation as being the you know the premier environmental law school in the country. And my colleagues always say, Oh, you you nothing you do it relates to the environment at, at all. And I always say, No, like everything I do relates to the environment because. Um, and I think it was, uh, you were saying that you work in uh, issues of, of uh, de international development and, and women as change agents in the environment. And that's right. I mean, I think if we're going to sort of have an honest conversation about how we're going to create sustainable communities in a sustainable environment, that a precursor to that is that women have to be empowered to make their own decisions and women have to be empowered to fully partake in that process. And absent that participation, it simply won't work. And, um, and I mean, that's just sort of a basic premise. And I think in the United States, we take for granted, maybe too much for granted, how much you know women's equality has advanced here. And I think it's allowed us to sort of move forward on many of these agendas. But I'm going to talk today about um, some global issues as well. So, um, and what I thought I would do, and I understand from Deirdre, that you guys can be a lively group. So feel free to think of this as a conversation and jump in and, you know, really to have more facilitate a conversation. But what I thought I would do is I thought I would share sort of three very brief stories with you about where I think women's empowerment fits into the conversation about economic sustainability and then we can use those stories as a conversation and I just sort of gave three brief stories in a way that I hope will be broad enough that you no know, depending on whatever field you're in that there'd be some some overlap there um, and I just made a little chart um, talking about reproductive uh, autonomy and ending violence against women and girls energy justice and then ultimately women's empowerment and leadership so I just want, we'll just talk about those. Um, and the first, and I know I sent out a, a reading about sort of economic development and the convention on the all forms of discrimination against women, um, and a little thing about women's leadership, because I know it's Women's History Month, I feel compelled to send those out. Um, and also, people get a chance to listen to the radio program at all, which I thought, and it's something that's nice to be able to listen to something um, about population control. But I thought I'd start with the population control example, because I think in some ways, for those of us who work on issues of, of women and gender equality, the population control question is often the one that abuts most frequently with my colleagues in the environmental field. Um, and so I was having a conversation with uh, Dick Brooks, who was the founder of our environmental law program, and um, he is a, an advocate for population control and indeed mandatory population control. And his, you know, belief as many environmentalists believe is that you can't sustain the planet in the long run unless we have significant population control, and that um, and that that voluntary programs um, or programs which provide incentives without coercion will never work, and therefore you need really mandatory population control. Now that's very controversial, as you know. Um, and so I'll just, this is just an advertisement from China that was actually before their one-child policy. So even before China's one-child policy was implemented, there was a movement in China to start to provide women with information about reproductive choices. Um, so as you know, and how many of you have worked in population control policies or had some experience with sort of how? So often people are very surprised to know that in the 1960s in the United States, the 1960s and 70s, the United States government also had, we often think of population control as being something that happens you know, in other countries, right, in developing nations. But in fact, that's not the case. In the United States, um, we for many years had policies of, of regarding population control. Um, uh, of course, uh, during the eugenics movement in the 1900s, 1920s, 1930s, uh, it, people were routinely sterilized in the United States. Women were routinely, in particular, women were routinely sterilized. And there's a famous case called Buck versus Bell. Has anybody heard of Buck versus Bell? A few of you have. So Buck versus Bell, Bell in, involved a case of a woman named um, Carrie Buck, who um, uh, was. Uh, in a home for the quote feeble-minded, um, although there, though we know now that there was nothing feeble-minded about Carrie Buck, she was raped and was was pregnant. She was from a low-income family, was raped and became pregnant. So she was essentially a teen pregnant teen mother. 
and she was committed to an institution and then was forcibly sterilized. And when she brought a case to say that I should not have been forcibly sterilized, um, the, uh, 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 it was before the, um, the Supreme Court, Justice Holmes from Massachusetts um, said, three generations of imbeciles is enough and upheld the constitutionality in the United States of forced sterilization. Um, many people don't know that history, but that in fact was the history in the United States. And then beginning in the 1960s, uh, the federal government had policies not only of, of funding uh, family planning and uh, sterilization programs abroad, but also in the United States. And there were many cases involving women in the 60s and 70s, primarily African American and poor women who were forcibly sterilized under the theory of population control that was also very related to crime control and social control more generally. Uh, so the history of population control, of course, is not unique to any con any developing country. We have our own history of that here as well. But what's been interesting to watch is what's been happening in countries like China and now in India that have been very, very aggressive about population control policies. As you know, China has a quote-unquote one-child policy. Um, and India has started to, to do something slightly different. I don't know if anybody's been following what's been happening in India, but the government has implemented a series of programs that provide very, very significant incentives for poor, it's primarily geared at poor, at the poor or lower classes, to, um, to become sterilized, quote unquote, voluntarily sterilized. And I say that because many people argue that people don't really even know what's happening to them. That was certainly the case in the United States. Women would go into family planning clinics and doctors would sterilize them essentially without their understanding of what was actually happening. They, many thought they were just having some temporary birth control. Um, and that's, there are sort of similar issues that are happening in India now. And then of course we know that in countries like China and India where there's gender preference for children, where you have um, preferences for male children over female children, um, you have significant emerging um, gender imbalance in many places, and then of course the termination of pregnancies of female children. Uh, sex selection, uh, sex selection, abortions are illegal both in China and in India, but they happen and there's actually an interesting trade that comes to the United States. The United States is one of the only countries that does not prohibit, in the United States you can obtain, in, theoretically you can obtain an abortion for any reason before, you know, the government cannot put restrict to restrictions on that before viability. We do not have any laws in the United States which prohibit sex selection abortion. Um, and so there's actually a trade, uh, a tourism trade. Uh, people, they call it reproductive tourism. And people come to the United States to have abortions to abort female children. Um, because they're often in countries which have policies or preferences for male children. So there's lots of sort of questions around when we talk about population control as a mechanism for environmental sustainability, if in fact we really aren't further, one, oppressing people on the basis of their class, because generally speaking, we tend to be middle and lower class people, but also that we're not reinforcing patriarchy or reinforcing male privilege or you know male preference because of in the of most countries the va the greater value placed on um, female as opposed to male uh, greater value placed on male children. But third, I think it raises a question that I just like to invite all of my students to think about: was when we talk about reproductive autonomy, what do we really mean by that? Um, and when in the United States, when we think about reproductive autonomy, we tend to think of it in terms of the ability to have access to birth control and to terminate pregnancy. Uh, but I always like to talk, and I think a lot of global organizations, particularly organizations that deal with women, are asking us to reframe how we think about that. And one of the ways we, where they're talk, we talk about reframing that question is the right to have a child if one desires a child, the right not to have a child, which would include the right to uh, birth control and health services, um, and also the right to parent that child, which is a whole other question about once people have children, whether or not they have the right to parent those children. And so what you see globally, and you heard about that in the radio story um, that I sent around, is a real movement to really reframe reproductive autonomy as related to economic sustainability around the questions of women's education and access to health services. 
um, and, 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 and by, but preserving choice for women. Uh, because what we find, what we're finding is that when women are educated about birth control, when they have autonomy, by autonomy, laws, for example, which punish forced sexual relations, in other words, laws where we enforce rape, laws where we enforce laws against marital rape, right, where you have, what we really mean by true autonomy is the ability to access health care, the ability to access birth control, the ability to be free from unwanted sex, um, and the ability to make one's own decisions that most women will prefer in small families. Hmm. They simply do. Um, and we've seen that in the West when we've certainly had those options. And, and there's a lot of argument that we would see that in developing countries as well, but that, that, you, but that we've substituted mandatory or coercive population control in absence of women's rights. Hmm. And so if you develop a regime where women have autonomy and decision making, <coughs> and access to those things they need, you don't need those kinds of policies that, that people will actually self, right? In other words, women will only have enough children that they can support. Um, and, and that is a big movement internationally, and one that I would just invite you to think about, because I know so much of what we talk about when we talk about economic sustainability is smaller populations, but how we do that, I think, is dependent upon having legal and social systems that give women choice. Yeah. But women in poor and rural areas have the least amount to legal rights than any other, than women in urban areas. And so high birth rates among those families may be as much a function of the lack of autonomy and birth control and also the lack, and also the enforcement of, of coercive sex, right? So we tend to think that all reproduction is voluntary, right? Which may not be the case, but I think we always, I think many of those e those economic studies were done when we haven't always looked at it through other lenses, right? And so we might be giving explanations to things. Now it may be it may be in fact true that you that you need ultimately more incentives, but I think we haven't put in place in many countries the underlying economic and legal structures to know what would actually happen. This is a footnote. This has nothing to do with um, uh, reproductive control. But one of my colleagues at Middlebury does a lot of work on polio eradica eradication in Pakistan. And she's been working on some big grants. And maybe you've heard on the news recently about efforts in that workers in Pakistan who've been going and trying to vaccinate against children against polio have met with significant resistance, including violence, and I think there's been some cases of work killed. killed, right? Yeah. Right? They've been killed. And she's part of the grant that's been doing this, and she's been very concerned, and as I've been chatting with her, I say, well, what's really happening? And one of the things she says is that it's the males in the household that are doing this. They believe that when the health service worker, you know, the, the, the woman who's been trained to vaccinate the children for polio show up the door, to vaccinate, they believe these are imposing Western values and they don't want that. And part of the imposition of Western values is perceived as giving women in those countries more rights, right? It's very threatening to the current social system. And so the access to birth, right? And, and so that's all within a regime where you have very few rights, particularly in the context of marriage. Um, so even with the polio ratification, for example, not understanding that cultural dynamic and along with the legal dynamic is really undermining those efforts. Um, so I just wanted to raise it. Not, I don't like. I don't have necessarily conclusions, but just for things for you to think about as you're doing your work. You know, understanding that what the the environmental community, at least historically, might have thought was the right approach, may not actually be the right approach in this area. Mm -hmm. um, let me move aside because I want to make sure we have lots of time for questions. So let me talk about a second area that is something that that we've been working on at the law school. That when I learned about this, I was just horrified. Um, even though it makes it makes sense. So when we talk about um, environmentalism and we talk about energy security and energy justice, what we're really talking about is how our consumption of energy affects the lives of real people, right? You know how how on everyone's daily life, energy makes a difference. And so I was shocked to learn that over three million women die every year in the world of indoor air pollution. Why? Because over 3 billion women and their families a year cook with biomass that pollutes. So they cook with wood, they cook with dung, 
they cook with, um, uh, byproducts of uh, uh, crop byproducts. Uh, they cook in their houses, and it creates significant air pollution. First of all, they spent, you know, there are women around the world who spend, you know, hours a day simply going out and gathering material with which to cook and then, um, uh, and then cooking. And, you know, millions of children every year affected by respiratory disease and other disease simply as a result of inefficient cooking mechanisms. Um, and so when I, when I first learned about this, I thought, well, this I mean, this is really a significant worldwide health problem. The World Health Organization has a program around this. There's, um, there's companies now that are trying to mass produce a clean, efficient, burning indoor cook stoves that could be distributed at low levels. But I thought this is really about, this is really also a question of gender equality, right? When we talk about how, you know, how the world functions, who, you know, what the roles are, what gender roles are, in our, in our world and how we distribute energy resources, this is a significant, significant problem that could be addressed. Now, okay, did you want to jump in? But one of the things that was interesting, so at the law school we did a survey, we did some work, we had a grant from some international organizations, and we looked at the success of putting cook stoves, and this is mostly in, in uh, Asia and in Africa, at the, 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 the um, the success of getting rural families to, to, to take what essentially are free woods, you know, free efficient burning stoves to cook with. And again, it was the same with the Pakistan example and the same with the birth control example. One of the major hurdles to doing that is the lack of decision making power the woman herself has over whether or not she can use this and the great skepticism of the West that implementing, you know, adopting these kinds of technologies will somehow be empowering and that empowerment will somehow undermine the social system that exists. Um, and so that to me just serves as another example that without the underlying sort of basic equality between genders that even these very progressive programs, I find, you know, the program to distribute, you know, clean burning cook stoves throughout rural, you know, rural, throughout rural countries, you know, rural areas, is, is really, you think that's really exciting, right? My husband's a wood stove, my husband's a designer, one of the things he designs is stoves, and he, and, uh, he, you know, thinks that this is just really, like, so exciting, like, it took some science, some scientists to figure out how to create very low-cost, energy-efficient stoves, right? And think of all the lives you could save, plus all the pollution you're stopping, right? Because there's nothing efficient about this, right? This emits a whole lot of carbon footprint. Um, but that, that despite all of that, it doesn't work unless you have some basic fundamental structures that provide women decision-making power and access to that. Can I just ask you about yeah. the nexus or the role of the justice system in that? Because I think there's a certain side that's social, that's kind of men and women's right. equality that has to be grassroots. But, right. but what, you know, what is the role of the justice system in starting to enforce Right. Equality to create the social change. Right. Well, I think that I think one of the um, uh, so let me actually that's a good question and, and let me go, let me go back to what I think what is the more basic premise, which is that in most countries, including our own, uh, the legal status of women was tied to the legal status of their relationship to men. So they were either they are either under the the control of their fathers until a man, you know, until they are grown, and then essentially under the control of their husbands, and legal systems operate to reinforce that. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example from the United States that might ring true. So, um, at the first Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, um, if you remember, that was the first women's rights convention in the United States. Lucretia Mott. Um, Frederick Douglass was there, and during that convention, the advocate, and it was, it was, you know, it was intricately also tied to the emancipation movement of, of slaves in the United States. They um, published something called the Declaration of Sentiments, and if anyone's ever, you know, when you drive across uh, 80 in New York as you're going to the Midwest, uh, if you need a place to stop, you should stop at the Seneca Falls Museum, which is on route, and you'll learn a whole lot about the history of the United States and about the women's movement in the United States. Um, 
but they published a Declaration of Sentiments, which is essentially a demand for rights. That included, for example, the right of women to vote, and that's often what we focus on, the right of women to vote. But one, there were ten sentiments. One of the sentiments was the right for women to be held morally accountable for their crimes. Hmm. Hmm. Because, I actually have the language I'll find on the computer, because the right to be held morally accountable for crimes meant that husbands could not use chastisement to keep their wives from acting what was called at the time, quote unquote, morally irresponsible. That's the language in the sentiment itself. So when we think about um, where legal systems, right, where mechaniz legal mechanisms sort of provide the basis for that, if, and this is true in many, many countries, that women are considered to be the moral extension of their husbands. And because of that, we have allowed, historically, men, you know, husbands to use coercion and violence against spouses under the legal justification that ultimately the men are responsible for the actions of the women. So without mechanisms to enforce a woman's independence, then that sort of the social system and the legal system simply replicate the pattern, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So if we can talk about that in terms of human rights, and that's where I want to take us next, because internationally, one of the biggest movements has been to um, look at what we call private violence against women as being an international human rights issue. So when you think about what that means is, so, so when the worker comes to, he's coming through rural Pakistan and saying, we, you know, here's a cook stove, we want you to take this cook stove, right? This, and they show you how it works and this will burn more efficiently and more, you know, cleaner. And, and, the, and, the, and the mother uh, uh, takes that and uses it and her husband says, I don't want you to use that. And who wins, right? I mean, who wins, right? Who, who gets to be the decision maker? How is that empowerment works? And if he can use coercion or violence against her, then she has, right, she has no essentially legal right. She's not able to fully partake in citizenship. And so the work, much work now in the international community is around private violence and affirmative state duties to end private violence as a precursor to all sorts of other issues, including economic sustainability. Because again, if you don't, so, so let me give you an example from the United States, and people are often um, uh, surprised by this. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to Jessica Gonzalez. And Jessica Gonzalez um, is a, a Latino Native American woman uh, who lived in Castle Rock, Colorado. Uh, which is a suburb outside of Denver, for folks who don't know. And she married uh, her husband, Simon Gonzalez. Um, and Simon Gonzalez was uh, increasingly abusive and controlling over the course of their marriage. They had three daughters and a son. And um, ultimately, Jessica divorced Simon. Those are her daughters there. Divorced Simon. And um, in the divorce decree, mm -hmm. Uh, Simon was allowed visitation with the girls, but only at very specific prearranged times to, to come and meet. Um, and one afternoon in June, the girls were playing outside in their front yard, and Jessica was in the back, you know, in her house, and she heard some screams, and the, Simon had come and kidnapped the three girls from the front of the yard. Uh, he actually kidnapped a, a friend of theirs as well, and then let the friend go. Um, uh, Jessica Gonzalez began calling the Castle Rock Police Department and saying, you have to come. You know, he violated this order. I have a restraining order. He's not allowed to see the girls except for these. This is not one of those times. I'm afraid he's going to hurt the girls. You have to do something. And she called them, you know, at least eight times over the course of that evening. She went to the Castle Rock Police Department. They kept telling her they're fine. They're with their father. He's not going to do anything. Don't worry. Don't worry. She got a call from him where he was with the girls, and she again went and said, call the police, here's where he is, he's with the girls, and he, they did nothing. Um, Simon Gonzalez at 3 o'clock in the morning showed up at the Castle Rock Police Department and opened fire on the police department. Um, and they shot back, and kill, Simon was killed, and they found the three girls dead in the truck as well. Um, the police claimed that they had, the girls had been killed by Simon earlier in the day, 
uh, but there's some factual dispute over that. They, they don't know if the girls were actually killed by the police fire or by Simon. So Jessica Gonzalez brings a lawsuit against the city of Castle Rock, claiming that she had a constitutional right of due process <coughs> to have that restraining order enforced, and that if she had known they were not going to enforce the restraining order, she would have taken other means to protect herself and her children, but that she relied on the Castle Rock Police Department. And I'm not going to go into the sort of the legal history that leads up to that, but she raises, essentially says, I have a, a right, just a constitutional right to this. And she wins at the lower court, and she wins at the circuit court, she wins and by, you know, the law talker. She wins before the whole panel of the Tenth Circuit, and I don't know, like, like that's a big win, right? Like, she was a, and, and her case goes up to the United States Supreme Court, um, and in a seven to two decision, so it was not close, the Supreme Court says, no, she doesn't have a right to have restraining order enforced. Um, that uh, even though the language of the, the restraining order on the back says the police must arrest, Justice Scalia says, well, that would really be undermining police discretion and that you don't have any constitutional right to have the state protect you from private violence. Right? You have no constitutional right to have the state in any way protect you. And essentially says, in essence, the restraining order is just a piece of paper. And the police can decide whether or not to enforce it or not. But he says, you know, if the people of Colorado want to pass an additional law that, that gives her the right to sue the police department, the people of Colorado can do that. But the Constitution itself, right, does not provide her with that remedy. So a group of um, professors and students from some law schools got together and they said, this can't be right. right? This can't be right from a human rights perspective. And so they filed a lawsuit in... Um, the in, at the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Now, anybody ever heard of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights? A few of you have, most of you, some of you have. So the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights is an arm of the Organization of American States, of which the United States is part <laughs> of. And the United States is a signatory to a human rights document called um, the American Declaration of Human Rights. Um, it was a, it's, it's, it, but prior to that, there was something called the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which was signed in 1942. It was the first human rights document the United States had signed. So it falls from that lineage. Um, the United States is not, by the way, a signature to very many human rights documents. Um, I should be clear about that. So people are often surprised that we're a signatory at all to human rights documents. Um, we're not a signatory, which is the most important, to the, the Convention on All Forms of, of the, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women called CEDAW. We're one of the few countries in the world that's not a signatory to CEDAW. And I can talk about that if anyone's interested. Um, so anyway, Jessica Gonzalez brought her case there. And the thing with human rights tribunals, the commission is not, there's two, there's two sort of branches of, of this. There's the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which is, a, which is an adjudicatory body. It actually has some enforcement mechanisms, and we're not signed up to that portion. But we are signed up to the commission, which is more of a fact-finding body, and then it makes recommendations to member states, so that's how it works. So it doesn't really have an enforcement mechanism. But anyways, the interesting thing is you have to have a final decision from your home country before you can bring a case because you have to have exhausted all of your national legal remedies. So when does it ever happen? The Supreme Court takes so few cases, right? When would you actually even get a case where you've exhausted all of your remedies? And here was a case where Jessica Gonzalez had exhausted all of her national remedies before court, and she brings the court before the International Commission. And uh, first, the question was whether or not she could even bring the case. And they had hearings about whether or not the commission would even have jurisdiction. And they ultimately ruled they did. It's, what's interesting about uh, the case is uh, when the court, the care case was decided in the lower court, it came up, the procedure was a, well, yeah, I hate to talk about it. It's like a motion for, there's no trial. It's called a motion for summary judgment. Just pleadings, right? They just write the story out and then they decide the case. She never even got to testify about what happened. So the first time she actually gets to provide testimony is at the commission. And it's online. The ACLU has a website that has all the, all the documents, including her testimony. Um, anyway, she testifies. They decide, and, and, and ultimately, in 2011, so you know, almost a, it's almost been a decade now since her daughters have been killed, uh, the commission says that the United States is in violation of the human rights, not just of Jessica Gonzalez, but of women in the United States in general. 
And they, yeah. They said a woman, like, couldn't have been the same if it had been her husband who had a restraining order uh, against her. Uh, yeah, well, around. yeah, except the, the one of the, uh, the, the articles is uh, one of, the, vi one of the, the affirmative obligations the state has to have under the declaration is the protection of, uh, is non-discrimination against women and uh, the protection of, vulner of vulnerables, and that includes young girls and young boys. So, and they said the, the history of non-enforcement was really a history based in gender discrimination because of the state non-interference into the marital relationship. And so that you couldn't trace back what happened to Jessica Gonzalez unless you could trace all the way back to a system essentially of male privilege. So, anyways, they said, despite the Violence Against Women Act, which thanks to Senator Leahy, has now been reauthorized, so that's good news. Um, despite the Violence Against Women Act, and despite you know the enormous progress we've made in the country about this, that the result of the Supreme Court, this, this Supreme Court decision, and a few others that I won't go into, means that women in the United States have no mechanism or remedy to hold the state accountable for its failure to protect them. And so the state had failed in its due diligence because unless you have a mechanism, so this goes back to your question, right, about how well, unless you have a way to actually give life to your legal rights, it doesn't matter that it's illegal what Simon Gonzalez did. If she has no way to enforce the law, right, or no mechanism to enforce the law, she really has no rights at all and recommended a series of things, both specific to her case, including exhuming the bodies to see what had happened to her. Um, her daughters, um, but also that the United States, by statute, implement some enforcement mechanisms because there was no otherwise there was no there, there was no way to enforce her human rights. This case comes in a line of cases from a, from other countries. Uh, Turkey, there was a case in the European Court of Human Rights against Turkey, which frankly is actually almost no different than this case. Um, and against Mexico, the cotton field case, many people remember the, the women in Juarez, Mexico, hundreds of women disappeared and killed in Juarez, Mexico, uh, with no state due diligence, and that case was decided just before the Jessica Gonzalez case. So we see across these international human rights tribunals, international human rights tribunals say, a precursor to any, you know, any basic foundation of democracy or any foundation of rights is that you have to protect women and children from private violence, um, and so, um, and so I raise that because I think if we think about all the three examples I gave, sort of coercive and mandatory population control, um, the the social structures that essentially put women's health and the environment significantly at risk without the availability of both technology and then the right to make use of that technology. And then cases about private violence, even here in the United States, which is now like China and other countries that we always criticize for being violating human rights. You know, we're no different really than that. Um, that all of those things have to be in place before we can really talk about meaningful, sustainable policies going forward, and that women have to be empowered to do that. Um, so I just wanted to educate you about that because so that's why I say to my colleagues, you know, everything I do is related to environmental. Um, environmental sustainability because of, because of that. Um, and if you ever are interested in any of these, the, um, when we talk about, I always talk about the importance of learning to tell stories for any work you do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the story of the Supreme Court in the Supreme Court decision about what happens to Jessica Gonzalez is such a different story than the story of the Inter-American Commission when they took testimony her. It's like two entirely different incidents. Right, two entirely different things. Um, so, um, so then let me just uh, sort of say, um, I think all of this doesn't happen without women's leadership and empowerment. And I gave you the article about CEDAW and women's empowerment in rural areas from an organizational structure. I also gave you the article about women's <coughs> leadership um, at the um, at the policy making level. Uh, but because it's Women's History Month, because I never miss an opportunity to encourage women and men um, to uh, take on leadership roles. Um, but I think much of these things don't happen unless there's women's leadership. I think Hillary Clinton, as Secretary of State, did a lot in this area. Um, I think she is really credited with bringing the cookstove issue to the World Health Organization and help making that go, even though the United, the United States has funded a lot of those programs. Um, she tried very hard to get the United States to join CEDAW uh, early in her tenure as Secretary of State. Um, that will never go anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, she and Joe Biden authored the International Violence Against Women Act, which 
never went anywhere in Congress, but she was a big, but she's Hillary Clinton, as Secretary of State, did a lot, I think, for women's empowerment, and as a result, I think, for the environment, because the more, the more availability that is, I mean, you can see many other women leaders here, and then I say you, because someone has to pick up that ball, right? And um, this really had nothing to do with the environment at all, but uh, I know Sheryl Sandberg's book, has, how many of you mm -hmm. talked yeah. about Sheryl Sandberg's book? Mm -hmm. Have you been following this kind of, this sort of thing, the mm -hmm. lean-in book? Some of you don't know Cheryl Sandberg is the CFO of Facebook, and a couple of years ago she gave a speech at Barnard College, a graduation speech at Barnard College, where she really urged, Barnard's a women's college, so she was speaking directly to women, she was really encouraging women to lean into their careers, to not opt out, to not make choices they weren't faced with making yet, and to not be afraid to really answer the call to leadership. And, you know, the, she's gotten some criticism because of you know, lots of criticism, but but I thought her basic message, just her basic sort of simple message, which is, you know, when you have opportunities to lead, um, I hope you will. I hope you will take that opportunity, and for, for and for the men too. You know, I, it's really important to have men engaged in these conversations, and we often think of women's empowerment as being one that should be those, you know, causes should be led by women, but that just doesn't happen, right? We have to all sort of think of that we're in together, so to maybe take some opportunity to lead and to envision yourself in this this block, right? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, the career choices you make early on are the ones that will get you in that, you know, to get you to those positions, to where you can really affect your change. Right, because somebody was sitting around saying, I can't believe women are, you know, spending five hours a day collecting firewood and then dying of cancer, from lung cancer, right? Like, somebody had to notice that and, and make that change happen. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what you perceive as the, the reasoning? Um, what are the political powers that be that, that are preventing the U.S. from signing up to some of these international acts? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think, well, one, with CEDAW, I think there's some very specific things that the United States doesn't want to have to engage with. Um, one is that just in the United States, we do not have a history or tradition of wanting to be um, to cede sovereignty to international bodies generally. Mm -hmm. And we, and, and even with the Organization of American States, again, the commission is just a fact-finding commission, but CEDAW does not allow you just, under CEDAW, member, or mem signatories to CEDAW have to submit a report every four years that is then reviewed by the United Nations that then can sanction the country for not meeting certain goals and requirements. Uh, so one, that would make us essentially cede sovereignty to some extent to the United Nations. So as a political matter, just generally speaking, you know, there's not a lot of will in Congress to make that happen. But there are some specific things that I think are interesting that would make it problematic for the United States, and it has to do with the Supreme Court primarily. Uh, so I'll give, you, I'll give you an example. So two years ago, Japan went through its CEDAW, uh, you know, its review under CEDAW. And one of the things that Japan was cited for was the availability and proliferation of sexually violent video games. Um, and I don't know if anybody knows much about these sexually violent video games, uh, but there are a number of games, um, one that's called Rape Play, where the whole entire point of the game is to stalk, capture, and rape young girls. Um, and so Japan has said, you know, so, so, so and they're widely available, they're, and so CEDAW says, well, you gotta get rid of those games, you know, the United Nations says, you either gotta get rid of those games or highly control them because, you know, we believe that that is a form of discrimination against women. Now, the Supreme Court had a case two years ago that said, we will not regulate violent video games under any circumstances because we believe it's free speech. And the First Amendment protects uh, that, the First Amendment, and, and is also said that child pornography, if, if virtual child pornography, so either I have an 18-year-old an who's, so child pornography you know is illegal, right? But it's only illegal if you use real children. Um, and, and, and the justification for outlawing child pornography is not because we somehow think viewing child pornography is an inherently bad for society or immoral, but we say we ban child pornography because the making of child pornography harms children. Mm 
right? So we're protecting the maker. But if there's not real children in the making of child pornography, there's no harm. So either, you know, child pornography that's uh, virtual, you know, simulated, or uses adults that are made to look like children is, per is perfectly legal. The Supreme Court has said that. So, I mean, there's just no way under our First Amendment that we could comply with, the, like, that's just an example of how we would never be able to comply with the demands of CEDAW. And I don't think, and the United States knows they don't want to, they don't want to do that. Um, and there's, but the, the, the primary resistance is not is not that so much as not wanting to cede sovereignty to the United Nations. Yeah. Are there countries that are like success stories in terms of like these three issues that you talked about, women, and like either like improving that? Uh, well, I think in terms of reproductive autonomy, I think the European countries, probably the northern, particularly the northern European countries, have the highest. You know, they, they have low birth rate, very low birth rates, um, and uh, a significant amount of gender, you know, self you know, perceived gender equity. Um, now, that's actually, I mean, this is an interesting question you raise, because if you look, look at a country like uh, Germany, for example, right, where you have very low birth rates among German born, you know, German women of German descent but relatively high birth rates among immigrants who come to Germany. And so the government, you know, has policies now to try to encourage higher, I mean, right? Isn't that the irony, like, to encourage higher birth rates among German families um, in order to have majority, you know, maintain, the, you know, the majority of German-born citizens. So, I mean... I mean, I don't know if that's a success story or not, right? Like, I don't know how you, I don't know how you evaluate that in terms of the success story. But population, I mean, there's lots of population control policies, and they're very manipulated depending on what the purpose of the government is. Um, you know, we could do, I mean, we have, I mean, in the United States, the birth rate continues to go down. Um, generally, you know, the birth rate continues to go down as women have access to education and contraceptions. Um, uh, if you wanted to increase the birth rate, you know, you would you could implement policies that would increase the birth rate. You could provide for paid maternity leave. Uh, but even in countries like Sweden and Norway that have paid maternity leave, you still have very, very low, very, very low birth rates among, you know, Swedish-born or Norwegian-born citizens. So that tells you, and again, I think it's a self, that tells you that when women have control over reproduction, they generally tend to preference smaller families as, on average. <coughs> but even then, it's sort of, even in the United Nations, in the environmental program, right, it's sort of relegated to a special office, as if it's not, hmm. in, it's like it's half the population, but not integrated at all. Hmm. And I think that's really been the problem, that's really, I think, the problem is that unless you... Have a, unless you really understand how gendered systems operate and how those gendered systems then affect human behavior, you really can't implement on the ground level meaningful policies. Um, and particularly if it's an afterthought, you can get it wrong sometimes. Yeah. I was very struck earlier when you were talking about um, the men blocking the women from bringing the stoves in, and you said they were afraid of change. And then you said, so we really can't implement these changes unless women have equal rights. And what, what struck me was you were agreeing with the men. Because effectively, you're not going to empower the women without changing the social system. That's right. right. That, yes, that's, that's right. That's right. Yes. And, and, and that, that, that low status male. I mean, one of the things I think we fail to appreciate is that when you're talking about poor folks in many of these places, the males are very low status in society. And, and, and it oftentimes feels like there is a zero-sum game, right? Mm -hmm. And so and there's been a lot, I mean, there's a whole sort of conversation about that in the United States, right? Anybody mm -hmm. following Hannah Rosen's work in The Atlantic or mm -hmm. her really forthcoming good. book called The End of Men, mm -hmm. where she really argues that a, that a consequence of women's empowerment has been to devalue men and men's contributions unintentionally even more, and that you know, it's had mixed results in the end. And so I think your point is well taken that 
I didn't, and I'm guilty of the, the way I'm sure talking as well, I didn't mean to suggest that it should be a zero-sum game between males and females within those relationships. It really has to be elevating the economic structure for all those families, and then the threat becomes less, right? Then, then, the, then the change in, within the relationship becomes less difficult. And it's the same in European countries. I mean, the more high status a family has, the fewer children they end up having. Right, same with population control, generally speaking. I just found your the juxtaposition ironic, right. and that it does lead to the conclusion that you need to have economic and social empowerment for everybody, That's right. and to make the men the boogeymen, it's kind of it goes in the wrong direction. Right, right, yes, and I didn't intend to do. I, I no, you did, if I no, you didn't, but it does bring up the point. Right, right. That we have to. I mean, that it's hard. Right, changes changing sort of centuries of the way gender the well, genders is. relate is hard. Right. right. I mean, it's hard, even in modern America. I Just love the Nora Ephron quote, you know? Did you ever see it? She would, what's the quote about, we don't think men can vacuum? You know, she talks about, well, men have to vacuum now. They know how to vacuum. They vacuum their cars. Haven't you ever seen <laughs> 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 that? She sort of said, that, that we don't, you know, that it's, change is hard, right? But maybe, no, he's not, I mean, your point was this, maybe not as hard as we think, right? That, but, but her, I would think that's funny. Because I'm married to a car guy who's um, so I'm really interested in this idea because I've been thinking a lot about how do you, like what's the role of men in a feminist environment and how do you make it, how do you make a good space for all of us to live peacefully and empowered together. And um, uh, one thing I'm really interested in about the uh, um, Scandinavian countries is they have a lot of um, their maternal leave policies yeah. also apply to men. Yeah, right, and I just am right. really interested in that movement in giving women equal opportunity in the workforce, yeah. but also giving men an equal stake and an opportunity to participate in right. family life that's as right. being part of their empowerment. And that's right. I don't know where the environmentalism is in that, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, one of the things that's been interesting, for example, about the population policies is I think mm. they've mostly been geared at, at, at regulating women's reproduction and not male reproduction, right? And so unless you start to be able to regulate male reproduction, mm -hmm. and men have much greater capacity for significant reproduction than do women, right? Mm -hmm. Just as a biological function, that you aren't gonna you aren't gonna get very far. And I, India is mm -hmm. doing more than that than China did. You know, India does offer sterilization to either males or females under mm -hmm. these incentive programs. Um, now, I mean, whether or not those the programs are just coercive for poor people, we can have a conversation about. But I think that that's been a more that's actually a, a change from the China program where. In China, the primary focus was on uh, was on women's reproduction and not just male reproduction as well. Um, that's right. You know, the that's I mean, the, it's an interesting and, and complicated problem. I think about how you promote policies that are gender that address both genders, and sometimes they have to be the same policies, and sometimes they may have to be different policies. Um, Sort of that difference between formal equality and contextual equality, right? That there's some kind of difference. Um, there was a study done. This this has nothing to do with population control, but um, it is a maternity policy. There was a study done a while ago that looked at um, uh, parental leave policies at universities, and it found that when mothers took parental leave policies, they spent the time on parental leave taking care of their generally newborn children. And then when males took them, they spent most of their time writing academic articles. And that there was a correlate that that if you took wow. a maternity policy, a, you know, a, a paternity policy or fa a family leave policy, if you were a male, you had a higher chance of getting tenure than anybody because you would Whoa. use as, as opposed to when women, right, took it. Because then they had a lower chance because they actually right so so the norm shifted right the the norm of what was right was shifting and you know then you say well is that right is that not right I mean do you, do you change the policy or do you just change the way the policy gets about you know the outcomes get evaluated um, you know because if you stop offering it to men then do you reinforce the idea that women are the primary caretakers you know there's all sorts of Sort of questions about that, but that was sort of always a sort of stark example of how you had a well-intentioned policy mm -hmm. that sort of had a unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. Many things in life do. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think, I mean, I think what's exciting is there's a lot of opportunity for 
the the integration of technology, legal structure, you know, legal structures, women's rights, international development, you know, there's and, and with with a lens towards gender equality, that really is exciting work that can be done in all sorts of fields. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, to, no matter what you're working in, right? What you, what you're working in. I think there's a lot of opportunity here. When I learned about the Cookstoves, I was so struck by that. I made my I'm a Girl Scout leader. I made my Girl Scout troop learn how to make solar ovens. <laughs> and, um, and I told them, you know, we, it, and I told them all about. It. Well, I told them all about this. You know, my nine-year-old troop. You know, they're nine and ten-year-old. I I told them all about these women and what happens to the indoor air pollution. And if they were interested in this project, what could they do? Right, and, and we started talking about you can be an engineer, right? We need engineers to envision these technologies, right? I mean, here's what I mean. The automotive industry hires a significant percentage of women engineers that design the interior of cars, right? Um, now, why do they mostly hire women to design the interiors of their cars? Because women are passengers and their kids oh, are passengers. Women buy most cars. Women yeah. buy most cars. That's right. Women are the number one consumers of cars. And women in household decision consumerism, right, who mostly make household consumer decisions, it's women, right? Mm -hmm. I think, well, the automotive companies already know that you have to have women at the table when you're designing things, right? They already know that. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I say, be, you know, what, what can you envision? You know, I say to you, to my nine-year-olds, what can you do? What can you do? You can, you know, you can learn to... Uh, Become an engineer, you know. Become an engineer and learn how to design products that affect women, at least in this day and age, to be more safe and efficient and healthy and less polluting. Right? That's a good job. You need someone to envision it. You're here. <laughs> so.